So, welcome to the first uh, seminar of Lent term. And I'm very, very pleased to be able to uh, welcome um, here, or welcome back here rather, Fabienne Viala, our speaker tonight. Um, Fabienne will be familiar to quite a number of you because she was actually here at the Centre of Black Rapping Studies and in the Faculty of English. Um, as a, I think she was called a Mellon postdoc. Yeah, it was a fantastic um, name. <laughs> uh, um, uh, in two th 2009, 2009 to maybe 12, yeah. roughly, or yeah. 11 to 12, um, for two years anyway, um, where she, uh, this was a postdoctoral fellowship that uh, was focused on Caribbean studies, yeah. or Caribbean literature. Um, since uh, she left Cambridge in 2012, since 2012, she's um, had a lectureship in, the, in Caribbean studies at the University of Warwick. Um, where she directs the Centre of Caribbean Studies there as well. Um, I mean, <laughs> I think, was that a lot? I think it was. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, Fabienne also has a book recently out, which is here. Uh, it's called, you might not be able to see the title from here, but it's uh, The Post Columbus Syndrome. Post Columbus Syndrome. Identities, Cultural Nationalism and Commemoration in the Caribbean. This appeared in 2014 um, with Palgrave Macmillan. Um, and today she's talking to us about uh, Columbus. And the title, which has disappeared from here, is um, From State Choreographed to Popular Memory in the Caribbean, The Case of Christopher Columbus. I think we need to get this back up and yes, going. Yes, wait. We do we need? Do I need to Unprobably. press and blank? Yeah, oh, sorry about this. Yeah, okay. here we go. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank thank you everyone to be here. I'm, um, I'm as Jeffrey said, I'm, I'm kind of coming back. So it's it's a pleasure to come back where the book started. When I started this project, it was just a project, and uh, it was the point was to look at a, or to try to understand. Uh, why on one, one side in 1992 there were a massive wish, input, energy from the side of Spain and of Europe to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the New World and on the other side having all the Latin American countries no matter how different they are, and you Latin Americans know that it doesn't mean much to say Latin American countries, but in this particular case, there was a very strong unity towards the fact that it was absolutely impossible, in absurd, in, in, impossible to even think that there would be something to commemorate. At least there could be a debate, we could debate about it, but celebrate the discovery, of course, and you know the whole debate debate about the fact that it was not a discovery, but an incovery and that kind of thing. And in the middle, the place where actually Columbus landed, the Caribbean, because Columbus, no way, he was not Latin American yet. We're not talking about Cortés or Panfilo de Narvaez, we're talking about Columbus. Where he set foot four times was really the Caribbean region, the several islands, a little bit of the coast, but we are really in the middle of Europe and, 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 the, and Latin, be, between Europe and Latin America. And I, was, I wondered what was happening there and what was striking was the very, very, very <laughs> noisy silence. That is to say that the place where I, we would expect, precisely as Caribbeanists, some sort of um, demand for recuperating any kind of relationship with the past and the 50th continuity of what happened in 1492, what is the state now in 1992, we would have expected that it could be coming from the Caribbean. And what was obvious was that there was no united debate um, and it was something that was problematic for me because it was refueling the very negative stereotypes towards the region, toward the Caribbean. So what I did was actually to look at it in depth and actually there was a lot happening on each island about Columbus, about the discovery and debating what was the impact of this 1992 anniversary. But the thing is that the debate was relocalized or recontextualized in very um, stage choreograph, and the title that Jeffrey very gently um, um, pronounced and that I haven't put in this slide because it was it was just uh, a slide presenting the title, but 
the state choreograph memory or history of the when everything started, that is to say when colonialism started, not everything, but the relationship with uh, colonialism, anti-colonialism and post-colonial situation. Well, this debate was happening in, um, within the boundaries of what each nation island was allowing memory to be, what each nation island was proposing or deciding, and I, I really am very, um, very uh, convinced about this notion of choreographing, because it was really something that was um, put up or set up in a way that was hyper-commemorative sometimes when it was the state deciding what to do with it. And the interesting thing is to look at this relationship with uh, the state choreograph memory and then popular culture, what, they, what, what was happening at the level of the people and what people wanted to say that they were belonging to, remembering to, or that, what they wanted to forget. So the, the, the balance between two was kind of repeating itself at each island level. But so hence this idea of a title, I think that what could, should come now for you is to explain a little bit this title, Post Columbus Syndrome, because no, it's not, it's not a book about genetics, it's not a book about medicine. Post Columbus is something that I decided or I felt the urge to, to, to name like this, because the notion of post-colonial, is extremely limited to embrace the Caribbean as a region. So post-colonial, from which point of view? If we think about post-colonial status as something that is, a, that is linked to independence and nation building, then we are faced in the Caribbean with a fragmentation of moments when post-colonialities happened at different periods in very different models, some following Latin America, some following much more third world decolonized situation in the case of the West Indies. So it, it, it was not possible for me, and I think actually that's why I'm really happy to be saying this here, because it was from this position that I had that was called a post a Mellon postdoctoral fellowship in post-colonial Caribbean and Latin American literatures, they're all together. And most of the first lectures I had with my students was to tell them, probably, <laughs> Natasha, you might remember that I was always saying, okay, post-colonial Caribbean, it doesn't work. It can't work. I mean, so there is something there that was not completely efficient to look at what we wa or I wanted to look in terms of cultural memory. Um, Maybe I should have said that from the start, but it's true that I'm, um, ten I tend to believe very strongly in the power of comparativism uh, and uh, looking at a, and embracing the Caribbean, not as a bunch of specific places attached to a next colony or a next metropole uh, with a specific language and a specific creole and a specific music and a specific dish. I think that all that are variations of a Caribbean community and a Caribbean much more enlarged um, uh, culture that is to be grasped where culture is uh, because that's where things go beyond um, politics and language. This is where I think memory can travel better. In a, in, a, in, a, in a more profitable um, way than what politics make of, makes of memory, in a way. Um, so the post Columbus is my, I would say, time scale. So it's a way to embrace the 50th and years, or the, the idea of the continuity between 1492 and 1992, um, in a way that is very much in dialogue with um, the, the notion of the longue durée, of Fernand Brodel. I, I'm trying to look at faces and to see if you're thinking she's really completely out of date, Fernand Brodel. Gosh, what is she talking about? But I thought it was really the concept, even though the, the, I was not taking it in the same approach because Brodel framed this notion of longue durée, which means long term, um, to look at the, Carib the Mediterranean basin and to look at the cradle of civilized, well, all that kind of extremely Eurocentric. It was not Eurocentric if you look in detail into his work, but the approach was still part of a specific will to uh, cut the throat of a Sorbonne French historiography at the time, right? And to open up 
the notion of history, saying history is not about dates, it's not about events, it's about things that can be visible and invisible, things that long for such, that happen in such a slow motion, like the, the way the geography changes, the way the, geog the landscape evolves, the climate evolves, that human beings cannot see it um, on their, uh, they can't grasp, grasp it. So long durée for him was a way to bring in a new reading uh, in order to open up actually to histories that did not exist, histories of mentalities, histories of women, histories of workers, and so on and so forth. But the, the bringing long durée in my perspective, the post-Columbus, was actually to really dialogue with what a, the Caribbean was, uh, the Caribbean islands were doing at home on, at, in, in, within the boundaries of its national memory molded choreography. The point was always to stress the link and the continuity, because continuity there is. Because, I mean, just think that a year ago, uh, the CARICOM signed uh, um, uh, a, a, a chart to recognize and to claim for reparations on, uh, for slavery on the basis that the underdevelopment of the Caribbean island is based in a structural continuity of colonialism, well, we can't deny that there is continuity. There it is about to kind of unpack it, I guess. Uh, so this is where I, I started all this. And um, the, the point for the last point I want to mention about, maybe I should just move to this slide because this way you can know where what I'm talking about when I was talking about fragments. So that is to say that I was, I had to do an intensive field work that implied understanding the extremely local relationship with memory, between memory and a specific sort of civil society where uh, the marks of colonial, I mean in the French Caribbean, the and in the Spanish Caribbean and in the English Caribbean, the moment of post-coloniality happened at different moments, and the relationship to whatever post-colonial framing was also very different, because actually, talk to people of the département d'outre-mer nowadays, Martinique, Guadeloupe, and French Guiana, and um, I mean, post-colonialism, where is the post in the story? It, it is, it can be at least neo-colonialism, but there is clearly a continuity in there. And the, the interesting thing is that it dialogues very well, even though it was not dialoguing in 1992 because of different memory discourses were happening in different languages and between islands that cannot travel to visit each other because of the colonial plain routes and because you need to go to Panama if you ever want to go from Puerto Rico to Jamaica or things like this. So there is a kind of nonsense of how much it costs and how much it is to go to the island next door, literally, or to the coast ne next door. But what I was saying about um, uh, this uh, continuity of colonialism or feeling of being a colonized or in a colonized situation and resisting and being struggling in terms of identity, uh, race, um, gender, and economic equalities, well, talk to Jamaicans and they will tell you that it is the same problem also, even if it's an independent uh, nation, but the struggle is still there, and there are still many battles that are on the same level. So obviously, the Caribbean in 1992 was reacting to the debate, but they were not. The invisibility of it was, for me, a sign of the very colonized situation of Caribbean studies within First World academia as well. So I needed to um, voice out. I would voice out this silence and bringing with the bringing the idea that um, uh, then I will move promise to case studies. But I wanted you to have an idea of what what is this post columbus syndrome. So the, the notion of of syndrome is really this. Um, I would say almost this um, a reproduction of a pattern of um, a relationship with memory at the cultural levels of the society that is broken, that is out of order, if you want, or that is, there, there is a, a moment when things are not going smoothly toward what it should be. I mean, because I, I take the, the position that collective memory is never normally and should be meant to empower communities to be more fulfilled, to be secure about themselves, to be united, and to know where they come from, hence to 
be sure of where they're heading to. I mean, for me, collective memory is at the heart of a, um, uh, I would say, a self self-sustainable community in some way. Uh, and here, what I had was that there was something not working in the, the DNA coding of this cultural memory in the Caribbean, because when you had one move of the state going one way, you had, at, in the very same local community, the population inventing another, or, or creating an alternative uh, framework for thinking about who they were together, their togetherness, their belonging, because what the state was proposing was not matching the reality, what they felt was their reality. So Columbus then became for me um, a way, or I would say a window, or a point of entry to look, I needed some sort of a, of a common of a common standard that I should move from one island to the other to look at this. So, because uh, the debate on the discovery was extremely personalized in the Latin American European debate, I mean, you probably have read all those postmodern Latin American novels that transform Columbus into some sort of very interesting guy who is. Um, bought by the Japanese to be paraded in some sort of carnival thing, who sometimes is gay in, in some novels. Who, so Columbus has been very, he is, uh, as a, not as a person, not as a pe person, but as a character, very rich in the sense that it brings in together many myths of traveling, of adventures, of mistake, of a, of uh, enslavement, of, there are a lot of a, uh, tropes. Uh, um, that that Columbus carries with him, so I thought it would be more pr prolific or interesting to to move along with Columbus. Um, and this notion of long durée then was very useful. This post-Columbus syndrome, that is to say, this reproduction of a memory pattern, but in the long durée, in the continuity, that was kind of repeating a very specific way to re restate, re-narrate your origin. It's a recycling, in a way, recycling the past all the time in order to justify for the present. Well, this post-Columbus syndrome was then something that, for the first time, I said, yes, here I've got something, because it's a way to show that a 90, 1492, 1992, okay, there are cycles that repeat oppression, exploitation, and so on and so forth. 1992, it's the moment really the European community is building itself, the IMF is tutelaging or taking a, a lot of, uh, of uh, care, taking care of the economy of the Caribbean. So it's a moment where the Caribbean islands are really very much, I mean, the Berlin, uh, the wall has fallen and the, the three world system is over. It's a globalization that is starting a new a process of neocolonialism. And really the 1990s were a moment when the, each of the Caribbean islands were feeling very threatened about uh, the rest of, of the world in a way and wanted to re, to take power again of their, of their memory. And one way to look at it was, would be or could be what happened when the 2010 earthquake in Haiti happened, uh, very sadly, and I don't know if you remember the international press, but a lot of readings tended to present this as a curse, as something, oh gosh, yes, the Caribbean is always doomed to be uh, trapped in those kind of uh, terribly tragic cycles of, and no matter if the, it was an earthquake, right, nothing to do with something that was man-made, but anyway, this idea that, that, that the area is a kind of Bermuda Triangle, doomed to some sort of invisibility of subalternity, to stay peripheral anywhere because they are tiny islands. Well, for me, actually, the continuity, looking at it via post-Columbus, uh, in, ter in terms of post-Columbus time and not post-colonial time, was <coughs> allowing for some space to think that it was the, the end of something and the beginning of something new. Uh, that is to say that the 1990s, where this thing that I was looking at as a syndrome was actually the sign of a transition, of, 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 of the end of a cycle of memory that had lasted for 500 years, and of something that was trying to reinvent itself or to restate itself, as if you kind of reload the matrix, right? You go back and you say, okay, during 500 years, we've been thinking about ourselves in terms of, of um, dependence uh, independence, colonial, anti-colonial, and so on and so forth. 
And now, because the previous or the, the metropoles that were um, uh, ruling over us are also trapped in another kind of, of uh, situation of subalternity wi within the world system, well, there is some space maybe to rethink about what we are and who we are and how we could be differently. So I, I think it was this the invisibility of the debate is actually a sign of the extreme um, vibrant turmoil. You know, when cells are trying to mutate, a lot of things are happening. And I think this was a moment of mutation, really, about the way each Caribbean island was trying to re-grasp uh, the patterns of memory that were at the heart of their national narratives and, and so on and so forth. So I could be talking about uh, all the case studies, but it would take me a week and you would be probably dead out of hunger and thirst and all this. So I don't want to impose that on you. Um, so just to mention that the way, I, the why I have selected what I have selected in terms of case studies, I looked at the islands that uh, were for me extremely representative of their uh, region in terms of uh, being the, uh, more the, the, like like symbols or like models for the rest of the of of the the archipelago. So I looked at Jamaica as a sign that it was a representation of all the English or Anglophone Caribbean um, islands. I looked at um, Cuba, Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic because he here we have the same heritage, the same history that was recycled in a completely different political agenda by the three islands. I looked at Haiti because Haiti and the Dominican Republic, I mean Haiti threw away in the water the, the Statue of Columbus, the Dominican Republic erected an extremely horrible phallic monument called El Faro a Colón that costed all the electricity of the country and, and a lot of un, a lot of, of of anxiety to all the Dominicans actually. Uh, and I tried to go beyond this first stereotype, right, that could reproduce the idea of Asians being historically anti-colonial and the Dominicans being historically kind of trujillista, which is not true neither. So uh, that's why I selected also this, this country. And, and I looked also at Guadeloupe and Martinique because the French Caribbean there had things to do. So Guadeloupe and Martinique that are over there. Uh, that are also um, uh, looking at uh, um, constantly uh, trying to address uh, really their situation, which is still a colonial situation, but which doesn't lead to a wish to independence. It's a very complicated situation. But what I've decided to talk to you about, and I hope you will be okay with that, so if, if there are disagreements, I can swap and change island and talk about another one. Um, it's Puerto Rico. Because Puerto Rico is a case that nobody talks about, I think, and that is, uh, in a way, a little bit um, trapped in a lot of a um, of, of stereotypes. But actually, when I well, being a Caribbeanist is always try. I don't know if you have to struggle about this when you are a Latin Americanist as well. But the first part of a job is to take the stereotypes to show them to say, "You've seen the stereotype? Okay, now we're going to break it." And you, you try to, to 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 do that. So the interesting thing is that in Puerto, Puerto Rico, celebrated pompously the 50th anniversary of the discovery of the new world. Um, it was because one man, El Gobernador Hernández Colón, um, his name is exactly like Columbus' name, but has no family genetic connection apparently, was very keen on celebrating the Hispanidad. So um, the Puerto Rico at the state level decided to create in 1985, and the name is really telling, uh, a commission for the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the discovery, but the name of it in Spanish, I think it's beautiful. It's called uh, Comisión Puerto Riqueña para la celebración del quinto centenario del descubrimiento de América y Puerto Rico. For those who didn't know <laughs> that America and Puerto Rico. And so I think that it's, um, it's already uh, showing us how much we are stepping in a kind of mind territory from the beginning. Um, so the, the point of Hernández Colón really, and the money he put in, 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 in dis a disposition to do lots of things, was to reunite what, what he called actually uh, something like um, 
um, um, um, get back our origin, or something like this. But the very interesting thing is that it came out of a complete erasure of anything violent that might have happened when Puerto Rico happened to be... Well, the reason why Puerto Rico speaks Spanish has nothing to do with anything violent in the, in the, in the, in the, in the view of Hernández Colón, right? So the, the very interesting thing is that there was um, a, a strong wish to uh, praise the cultural legacy or the cultural link uh, with Spain. So you had, as a result, uh, visits of the Spanish kings and queen Plays were performed in front of, in front of them. You had a, a pavilion, a Puerto Rican pavilion at the Expo 92 in Sevilla. You had, what else? You had a fantastic Regata Colón, um, which um, I, I don't have many pictures, but I will show that in, in a bit. But the, 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 this Regata Colón was actually arriving in Puerto Rico uh, in um, May 1992, sailing from Cadiz, no matter that, the fact that, in, well, I mean, in 1992, it would have been at, well, the anniversary maybe of when uh, Columbus arrived in San Salvador de Bahamas, but not in Puerto Rico. He actually arrived in Puerto Rico in 1503. So if the commemoration would have wanted to be really exact, it was not. But it was not, it was not the point. The point was to do some sort of huge festival to commemorate the, ori the Spanish link and the Spanish origins of the Puerto Ricans. So it, it was something that brought um, actually three caravels of Columbus in the port of, uh, in front of Del Moro. Uh, it was, so with, I mean, really something like really, of, I think it's difficult to imagine how much so, a, a full city, San Juan de Puerto Rico, became a sort of historical parade, re-enacting, re reliving the moment when allegedly Columbus arrived with his three caravels. Um, the, 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 the other very interesting thing is that it led to the establishment legally of Spanish as the official language of Puerto Rico, which is still the case, even if for plenty of legal matters and justice and trials and and lots of things that implied um, the help from the state. Everything has to be written in, in English, in American English. But uh, it's, it's very true that, um, I mean, in, within the city, there was a whole money involved in um, putting back together El Cuartel de Vallaja, which was the, the colonial, uh, um, where the militaries are. Um, so it was, it was really to, to sh and, and then to, to transform the center of San Juan as a beautiful historical um, uh, jewel uh, of which all the beautiful things came out of Spain, out of the time when Puerto Rico was Spanish. So no doubt that it was extremely, um, extremely consensual. And what was, so what I want, this image is just, I don't know if you know this, it's the escudo that represents the Instituto de Cultura Puerto Riqueña. And you see that you've got a Taino holding a semi, you've got the black slave holding a machiti, and you've got in the middle someone who is probably not Columbus, but Juan Ponce de Leon, who sailed after Columbus, with a book. So it could appear that the free associated state has got this miscegenation myth about the fact that the three cultures are at the same level, the characters are designed in the same etc. and so on. But if you look at it a bit more, you see that there is a huge difference between what each of them is remembered for. So the slave is just remembered for working a work a workforce. Uh, the, 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 the Taino, that's fine, is dead and he is the religious, the mystical part of what we have as Puerto Rican. That's fantastic. That's why we are so much better, because we had some sort of Taino moment in our heritage. But in the middle, the ones who stand there for the word, for the truth, for the religion and for all sorts of things that we could uh, read within a book, because we've all read uh, Lyotard and Adorno, so we know what to do with when a book is represented on, on an escudo. But here we have really the way the free associated state has leveled up the different heritage. So what do we do with Columbus when we have um, 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 a, a state that is associated like this? Um, you know that Puerto Ricans are American citizens, right? 
but they cannot vote for the American president. That's, that's the, the tiny difference. So they are really in this in-between space of being, of belonging, but not that much, and of, and being actually, um, what, what the, what the Quinto Centenario in Puerto Rico brought out is that what was the national narrative was to say that Puerto Rico should, and Puerto Ricans should be proud to be Spanish speaking American colonized people. That's, that's literally what is behind this stage molded choreography with major, uh, major uh, elements. So I'm sorry for the quality of the image, but <coughs> what you see on the, on the, on your left hand side is the logo, the little logo of the Comisión Puerto Riqueña, blah, 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 that I presented to you, where you have the three cloth of the caravelas. And what is interesting, and I think it's power, what, and there you have one, one images of the caravelas, but sorry about the quality of the pictures. It's actually quite difficult to smuggle that kind of pictures from libraries. Um, so I was probably <laughs> hidden somewhere between the air conditioned and the plan to, to take this picture. But the idea is that you see this logo, this, this estampa with the, the three, the three caravels and the, the sign of the religion of the Catholic king and queens that is represented by Columbus. Well, it gave um, uh, birth to plenty of books at all levels of what we can consider uh, uh, interesting to read, because it's not only literature, but also books about geography, books about the fauna and flora. So it was, it was a massive enterprise in terms of cultural politics of the state was not only monument and not only bringing some sort of festival of, yeah, let's be Columbus for three days and have fun. It was also something that was meant to produce a lot of a vulgarized version of history to everybody in the streets and to the people. Um, one example, so again, sorry, I don't have the image of that, but believe me, it's called Historia Gráfica de Puerto Rico. And it's really a comic book, a leaflet that was really given for nothing where you have the history of the encounter between Columbus and the Tainos. And obviously Columbus is arriving to save them from the cannibals, the Caribs, and they're very grateful. And then you have images where the Tainos are talking Taino and you have some sort of translation and they hold uh, an object and you have a little bubble telling you what is the name of the object and what it was for. So it's Puerto Rico educating the Puerto Ricans to be proud to be coming from the, t the Tainos in the version that is suitable with the Spanish one. Because, I mean, Columbus and the Tainos, duh, duh, that's really nice. That's Sesame Street, right, if you, if you look at this leaflet. Interestingly, the same leaflet was done for black people arriving in Puerto Rico. And there it's much less developed. The leaflet has completely, dis there is one example, one copy at the UPR, at the Universidad de Puerto Rico, but it was not published in many, many, many exemplaries, because many, many issues. Because actually you got from my escudo just before, but, and if you've been to Puerto Rico, you might know that the whole leveling of this miscegenation is actually to tone down whatever black or, or the blackness of Puerto Ricans. So Puerto Ricans, black Puerto Ricans are extremely exoticized and kept in a place where they still have they clearly are or, or do um, um, need, or they need to produce their own collective memory discourse because in the main one, the free associated state, they don't fit. And clearly they didn't fit in Hernandez Colón's um, story of Puerto Rico, that's for sure. Um, so the, the, um, I have a little bit of time, do I have, yes, something like 10 minutes, something? Yeah. So um, one thing that, because I wouldn't want to leave you with the idea that Puerto Rico was only about this completely delusional, um, expensive uh, representation of a completely fake and absurd uh, memory story. As it is the case, and as I mentioned, um, and that was the point of my title, state-molded uh, commemoration and popular memory, uh, again, what the state was performing was not necessarily what the Puerto Ricans wanted to hear. So yes, they went in the street to have an ice cream because there was nice caravels to show to, to your kids, but that doesn't mean that you, you get and you buy it all. And one thing among the many cultural events, counter-cultural events that happened, I want to mention one that I think is really interesting and very nice that happened at the level of performance. It's a play that wrote, that someone called uh, Roberto Ramos Perea 
wrote in 1993. Uh, Roberto Ramos Perea is the creator. I think I have his face. It's on the left hand side. Um, and I will explain to you who is the, the character on the right hand side. It's not Columbus, but you can figure out or you can think about it. Um, so Ramos Perea is a very, uh, don't think that he is, some of you know his work or of his work, because he's, he's really not someone who we, we should think about as, oh, the guy who wrote the anti-Columbus play, right? Someone who stepped into the propaganda. Is someone who has set up the Ateneo Puerto Riqueño, who is a, he teaches theater, he translates world theater into Spanish, if you want to put it this way. I'm just uh, uh, um, a bit take it, saying this to be a bit uh, uh, against some sort of events in world literature at the moment that are happening, and that tend to just translate all literature in English, which I don't think is quite good in terms of world literature. But so and 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 creating his own play, so it's it's a very Huge personality is also very involved and committed in the in the in the civil society, and he speaks his mind. So he's well known for being someone who doesn't uh, pretend that uh, a cat is a tiger if the cat is really a cat. So it's that kind that kind of personality. So his play, the play that he put forward, is called Misty Blue. That's the title you've got there, and uh, Misty Blue is a very interesting story. When um, that, uh, I'm trying to get into my notes and I will, yes, because this part I will read a little bit more just to not miss anything. So the play begins with Cas Casanova, so it's Casanova arriving in the New World, which is the island of Puerto Rico, um, chasing uh, the famous Count of Saint-Germain, who is actually a, another historical character, uh, who has invented a potion that gives you eternity, eternal life. And this potion is called Misty Blue. If you drink one drop of Misty Blue, you live for 100 years. Count Saint-Germain has drinking five drops of Misty Blue, and he is doomed to live 500 years more. And he really is disgusted about this. So he flew to the new world to at least find a way to get in peace with this eternity that he didn't want. Casanova is aging, he's losing his sexual vigor, and life is not fun at all because he can't be uh, as a performance, performer, performant as, as he normally should be as being Casanova. And he's chasing uh, the Count Saint-Germain to get the Misty Blue because what he wants is eternity in order to stop being aging and to be able to um, um, continue his life uh, uh, of debauchery, right? Um, so what is interesting is that when Count Saint-Germain appears on stage in scene two, so it's not quite this one, it's just before he holds the misty blue, but just before he holds a skull, and you know who is holding skulls in British theatre, so that I don't need to tell you, and is desperate to find the antidote that could allow him to literally stop the curse of his longevity, of his 500 years. Um, in the rest of the play, uh, what happens is that Casanova is going to be tricked by Saint-Germain. Saint-Germain is going to make him try an antidote that actually kills, because that's what, what he wants is something that breaks the, the magic of the Misty Blue. And uh, Casanova takes it and finally dies. I mean, he, 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 he became, uh, I don't know what is the, 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 what would be the word in English, but let's say that his uh, uh, sexual vigor is obviously going down until his life finally gets out of him. Uh, and so um, it ends by the fact that the uh, uh, Count Saint-Germain is absolutely delighted. I said, gosh, yes, I'm going to die. I'm going to be able to die. In the in energy of the joy, it, 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 it doesn't take the right bottle. It takes more Misty Blue, and that's how the play ends, in a way. So now you're looking at me, you're saying, what has it got to do with Columbus? The plot of the play is based on two delusional versions of the memory syndrome that the Puerto Ricans are inhabiting. Uh, summarized by, it is summarized by the Count Saint-Germain when he says that the Puerto Ricans celebrate everything, even their humiliations. Casanova refuses to admit that his glorious times are over and his sexuality in decline is clearly a metaphor of, Europe, of Europe's colonial past. 
Um, and I pass the sexual metaphors that clearly are um, uh, using the phallus of Casanova as an example of the pre preposterous arrogance of Europe. The quest for eternity and monumentalization, remember the Cuartel de Vallaja, the, the Regatta Colón, all this, is actually so well embodied, uh, that was so well embodied by, the, by, by Hernández Colón, own desire of memory is here criticized to be a very a delusional attitude that implies a, a perpetuating the illusion of the possibility of the past when power and conquest were still possible, still irresistible. Um, so interestingly, Misty Blue, the name of it, is clearly because of the color of it and what it means in the play it probably is some sort of Viagra, but it has some sort of mysticism in it and nostalgia, the blue. The, the, and of course you've got the Puerto Rican Spanish putting the, the, the accent at the end to make it misty blue, because then it's not something like, uh, that, that sounds too English, right? So the, the interesting thing is that the new world and more specific Puerto Rico is portrayed as the laboratory of this memory manipulation of the setting of a fool's game between the two European reactionary attitudes embodied by the two characters. While Casanova wants to perpetuate the past at any cost, the, kind, the Count of Saint-Germain refuses to accept the slow process of life. And interestingly, when he arrives on stage with the skull, he has been already condemned to 200 years. He has actually he drunk two drops of Misty Blue. And drinking the whole bottle will then make him eternal. But the 200 years are meaningful because 1992 is one thing for the Puerto Ricans, but the other dates that come just after is 1998, which is the anniversary of the 200 years of the Spanish-American War, 1898, when Puerto Rico, 1898, 1990, um, 1998, 100 years, sorry about this. You, thank you. Thank you to the historians to remind me how to count. But you see, there is this, this clear, um, so he's been, he's been the, 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 the numbers that are floating in the play are 500 years, 100 years, and then eternity. So it's a whole parable or allegory of this impossible stand that the Puerto Rican can, can take when it is about looking at their origin. And the fact that there is a, a clear mess up or a, a completely um, impossible posture to get. Um, one thing that you might want to know is that th there is a third character in the play, Madonna. And Madonna is the pop star Madonna. She is a Count Saint-Germain lover. She doesn't get really very much satisfaction with Count Saint-Germain when she sees Casanova arriving to say, gosh, it's going to be the, my, most, my moment to have fun and to be a material girl. But it, it doesn't work quite like that. And the interesting thing with this character, Madonna, which is completely instrumentalized like Misty Blue is, right? She's just here to give an anachronistical and melodramatic and funny kind of uh, or light um, uh, um, uh, element in the play. Well, what is interesting is that a year after Madonna will come came came to Puerto Rico, and it was a huge scandal because she actually. Um, performed some sort of sexual ritual with the Puerto Rican bandera, with the Puerto Rican flag. And it was a kind of huge thing in the press and something like this, so anti-Catholic, anti-Spanish, anti-whatever, right, you could imagine. But what I mean by this is that Ramos Perea was, I, I, he really genuinely, I don't think he, he, could, he could have, maybe there were rumors about Madonna coming, but he anticipated something that actually happened in the press afterwards. The point of this, I mean, this play that was performed in El Ateneo in 1993 was a couple of, in, in March 1993, so a couple of, of months after the whole kind of big festival of the hyper commemorative Columbus, it was very popular. I mean, the Puerto Ricans, went to this play and they enjoyed it and they laughed. So, and, and, and it's something that I think shows that they're, they're, even if we can, if we look at it from the point of view of a completely stage choreograph, a completely performative, um, delusional performance at the level of the state, at all the levels of the society, there was some space to actually say, well, hang on, 
this is this is a mess, but we acknowledge this is a mess, and we we better laugh about it and take some position. So I've not selected all the other publications that are more serious in maybe I don't think it is more serious. I think that that kind of play proves that there is that cultural memory is a matter of everyday life and of everyone who is living in any community. It's not something that is only happening at the level of politics or academia. But there were a lot of debates happening between, among historians, among uh, intellectuals. So it, it, a lot of people voiced out that they disagreed completely with Hernandez Colón's approach. But what is interesting is that those who don't voice out because it's not their job in the society, because it's, they don't have a place to voice it necessarily, they voiced it out of going and laughing at Casanova and San Germain and the fact that you can, you can actually take all this as a big farce and as a, big carni a bit of a carnival that you don't need necessarily to take so seriously, but giving, I think, some sort of... Um, space for rethinking collective memory in a more or in a healthier way I would say. well thank you very much i think that will i will end it here thank you